It's my great pleasure today to have the opportunity to sit down for a brief chat with a friend of Whitworth, a longtime friend of Christian higher education and a new personal friend of mine, Makoto Fujimura. Uh, welcome back to Whitworth, Mako. Uh, Mako Fujimura is a distinguished contemporary artist and writer. He's the director of Fuller Theological Seminary's Brehm Center for Worship, Theology, and the Arts. He is also founder of International Arts Movement, and he served as a presidential appointee to the National Council on the Arts from 2003 to 2009. Mako's on campus today speaking to chapel, just spoke to a, a packed a house at chapel, wonderful, spending time with uh, our students and faculty. It's been amazing. And having this exhibit at Gonzaga uh, Museum, which, which is a fantastic museum there, is, is um, gratifying and it's, it's a when I when I speak, I like to have my work behind me, so yeah. it makes sense to yeah do that. Good, and I saw, saw you uh, talk at a. Well, no, it's okay. It's been a good pace, and um, I, I love speaking to young people, and um, that that was such a privilege to be there, and yeah. today as well. Great, great. Yeah. Now you were on our campus about. 14, 15 years ago right. as an artist wow. in residence, spent a couple of thing. weeks yeah. with us. In fact, I have one of the pieces you did yes. for us hanging in the yes. president's home, yes. which we're privileged to have. Yeah, so you, you're not, a, you're, you're not unfamiliar with Whitworth. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I remember being here and uh, the, the trees were different, <laughs> but uh, no, it was, it was a wonderful experience. Well, I've recently had the opportunity to read your latest book on culture care. Uh -huh. um, in the book, you describe having a, an otherwise trivial conversation with your wife, uh -huh. which had a profound impact, I think, yeah. on the way you saw yourself, yeah. the way you saw your work, yeah. the way you saw your calling. Can you yeah. recount that story? Yeah, so Judy had... Uh, um, we were newly married and very poor, you know, whatever that means, but <laughs> we didn't have anything to eat uh, that weekend uh, really to speak of. And and I was really worried about it, you know, I, I wanted to be responsible and, um, but she brought home a bouquet of flowers and probably was five daughters, you know, but but I got really upset because I, I said, you know, we should we should be worried about the weekend. And she said, uh, well, we need to feed our souls as well. Mm -hmm. And it, that just devastated me. Like, I'm supposed to be the artist. You know, I'm <laughs> supposed to be the one that, you know, can persevere and create beauty and scarcity and, and all of that. But I totally failed that, that, that day. And, and ever since, I've been thinking about how that single gesture of generosity um, had opened up so much of my path as an artist and you know and then this despite the brokenness that we experience in life and trauma that you know we we have gone through and we're still going through but it's it's something that keeps coming back to me as a as a reminder and, and that god has created the universe in abundance um and we bring scarcity into it you know we have not only fight for our territories, but we have this mindset um, of being filled, filled with fear and anxiety rather than trusting that God's abundance is going to uh, multiply uh, into our lives. And that really uh, brings us to the topic of this book and your lecture here at Whitworth tonight, yeah. Culture Care. Many of our watchers maybe have heard of creation care yes. or perhaps soul care. Yes. What is what is culture care and why does it matter? Right. Uh, so I was just at Baylor University giving a keynote address, uh, their uh, stewardship of creation mm -hmm. talk. And what I said was one of the problems today with any kind of activism is that it's, it, it, it gets truncated in, into an ideological um, framework of scarcity. So 
anytime people talk about the environment, it's it's, it's as if you know it's, it's a Greenpeace issue, and and the, you know the conservative side they, somehow creates a binary between caring for the environment and and this um, idea of capitalism. It immediately gets politicized. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's, it's mm -hmm. you know just on the, you have to choose, you know, as if and and that is not only force economically force but but it, it is just toxic to how we talk about either economy or the environment mm -hmm. um, and what we need are people who can see the whole picture and um, use language well to communicate well to uh, com uh, and, and sometimes com communicate beyond language through visual means or through music or even theater uh, and dance to to say that there's this abundance that in the universe that that is still true that that allows us uh, even if you disagree with each other you you could have a conversation uh, you know gardening is a good example because you know people may disagree on what a dandelion is you know the one person it's a weed to kill and the other person it's a you know part, part of salad right <laughs> but nonetheless you can talk about so you know, why shouldn't we use pesticides because the bees are dying and we need bees to pollinate and, and so forth. You can have a rational discussion, even if you disagree on some points, but you agree to take care of, of the soil, um, to, you know, cultivate the soil in order that you can grow the things that you want to grow. And, and that, it seems to me, a simple gesture is not being exercised in public discourse today. And, and certainly in a mindset, when you look at social media, you know, people just jump on to latch on to the, these um, ideological, you know, um, um, the lockdown that, that is not very helpful to understand each other or to, as Jesus commanded us to, to love our enemies. I mean, that is there um, because he was projecting this idea of abundance, um, that God has created abundance. Uh, even if you're living in this uh, limited resource territory of, you know, Palestinian lands, um, you know, this Armageddon Valley, you know, where you have to, con every inch is contested. You may be invaded tomorrow. You may lose everything. Um, yeah, Jesus speaks about loving your enemies, uh, be, be good to those who persecute you, to um, uh, blessed are the meek and, and the poor and those who weep. So that's principally an opposite message um, and both creation care and culture care related in, in that sense, that culture care brings the language of abundance in, into a place of scarcity. And it has been proven over and over again how the arts um, can do this um, in, in very desperate situations like Auschwitz, where if you don't have the arts, music, theater, and humor, you are likely to not survive. And, and yet we, we see over and over that this is happening all over the world. But here in America, it's supposed to be a place of abundance. Mm -hmm. We fail to exercise that. Yeah. Authors like Andy Crouch and Jamie Smith at Calvin yeah. have reminded believers, Christians, yeah. that culture is not something that yeah. acts upon us, right. that we have this um, privilege, maybe even a divine responsibility yes. to shape yes. culture, to pour ourselves into culture to create goodness, yeah. truth, and beauty. Yeah. Um, what about our culture is broken? What do we what do we need yeah. to be paying attention to as yeah. followers of Christ as we try to shape culture in ways that point to him? Yeah, so the it seems to me the entry point is our brokenness and and how we fail to be good stewards. And um, instead of trying to cover it up and wearing a mask of some kind of, you know, Uber, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, um, leaders that um, we, we, sh we should be instead talking about uh, a journey um, that uh, uh, is fallen and is broken, it's, it's fractured. Um, and yet the gospel of this freedom, of this abundance flows into it um, uh, exactly because we, we struggle. Um, and that authenticity and vulnerability is 
something that we learn to dismiss in in education in you know somehow like this resume building uh supersedes um being authentic or you know being being able to share our journeys together in a communal way so what i you know i always say we're not really credible unless we're making mm -hmm. like that's what the church has always been able to do except in 20th century <laughs> like we, we somehow skipped <laughs> this huge stewardship responsibility of creating into the world and as you know the culture is not um you know this this reality that we can even if we wanted to push against or to escape from we are swimming in the waters so you can't just fight culture wars in order to escape from the reality of the fracture that that the entire culture is in fact it seems to me that because we're not making into that fracture with authenticity, we have no credibility when we say that God is real. Uh, because they look at our lives, they, they see the hypocrisy, they see, you know, the even the masks that we were wearing and and say, well, I you know, I much rather be with those who are authentic, you know, but broken. And um and that that I see in young younger generation, um, they they have totally kind of you know put um, this hedge around them, saying we don't want to fight culture wars. Mm -hmm. We've seen the damage mm -hmm. that it does, you know, and and it does it's not pretty, and we want to see a beautiful world. Mm -hmm. And um, how can we do that? Well, there's activism. There's all sorts of things that younger generation is doing, but we we also know that you know it's not just be by getting busy into the world and and fixing the problems. Although that's certainly noble, and that's part of education is to help you know young younger people learn to uh, repair the world. But you have got to have a vision, a dream that moves beyond the horizon. Otherwise, you, you know, you restore the world for what? <laughs> you know, um, what is the world that you long to be um, for your children and your grandchildren? Well, that's something that is has been undefined. And the church has always been a forefront of that. Um, and, and in 20th century, unfortunately, I think we kind of stepped back and said, well, we have to defend our turf. You know, it's it's it's. So I always say, culture is not a territory territory to defend or fight over, mm -hmm. but instead it it is a ecosystem to steward. It's a garden to tend to. Mm -hmm. um, we need to do the work necessary, hard work, you know, tilling and preparing the soil for the next generation. But we also need to, you know, be sharing that journey with those who we may disagree with and. Mm -hmm. And they may have a better idea than we do how to, how to do that. Yes. So learn from them. So Whitworth, as you know, is a liberal arts institution. Yes. We we really value the yeah. role that the arts play in yeah. education and informing yeah. human lives yeah. for meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. um, the arts clearly have a role in helping to shape and nurture culture. Um, what would you say to the accounting student or what would oh, you yeah. say... Yeah to the student who's going into an elementary classroom, yeah. Yeah. what is their role? What can they do to yeah. help shape culture in the ways yeah. you're talking yeah. about? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you, you you have to have accountants, plumbers, you know, <laughs> these, these are very necessary, especially in a world in which um, things have become so polarized and black and white. Um, the, any kind of objective field that, that can be defined like that and, um, can can serve to help the fracture, not by just you know doing accounting well and uh, doing plumbing well, which 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 is definitely you know important. Uh, but what I mean is that you end up with a big mess in either case when those two people I mean, mess up, right? My goodness, <laughs> you know, like yeah, exactly. And um, but you know, like imagine an accountant who sees numbers as beautiful 
a plumber who sees service as beautiful, that he or she is doing what they do, not just to get a paycheck, but to serve their community and, and to literally bring um, heating. That's a different vision, you know, and you can be doing anything in the world. You can be, you know, uh, working at a post postal office or uh, driving Uber and have these opportunities to uh, inject beauty and mercy into the world. And to me, that's not only that's an advantage of liberal arts education because it creates an integration point, but it's an advantage, huge advantage of Christian liberal arts yes. organization. Yes. Um, there's no other paradigm, right, under which you have this model of abundance that you absolutely, uh, it's essential at the heart of it to have beauty and mercy operating mm -hmm. in every sphere, whether it be engineering, mm -hmm. whether it be phys, you know, uh, phys ed, I, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you, you have to have that, because without that, you, we will not have the um, you know, integration necessary to bring education uh, into the whole person. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we will soon be fractured. You know, yes. we will have these specialties that do not speak to each other. Um, and, and worse yet, we'll be fighting culture wars. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Mako, you're a man of deep Christian faith. Um, you're also a person who God has gifted to be an immensely talented artist. How do you see those two identities coming together to help you form your understanding of calling or vocation in your life? Right. So, you know, I used to think that I'm a little bit odd, you know, <laughs> that, that I see things in the world, that I, uh, I walk around and I, uh, everything seems to speak of God's grandeur mm -hmm. and there are burning bushes everywhere and and I, I can't really seem to get from A to Z very quickly because I, I have to stop and and I you have a prophetic calling then you know, almost I mean, yes I, I, I felt like you know I'm, I'm just not gonna I'm just not normal you know and and I I, I used to try to fit in and and hide all those uh, uh, observational yeah. skills and uh, my heart which was always you know Seem, seem, seems to be generating something, making something, and um, then then I realized that at some point, you know, I I, I don't need to be defending that. I, I, that's a gift that God has given me, and in fact, I need to push into it. I need to understand it better. I need to help people who don't see that, you know, but but that they can see it if if they just slow down enough, and 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 I. My job as an artist is to guide people into that process. So, you know, any kind of experience, right? I'm doing this exhibit at Gonzaga, and this lady from Australia mm -hmm. traveled all the way wow. to see this exhibit. Yeah. And we were standing there, she was standing, I didn't know her at all, and she said something that was so profound uh, about this. You know, she said, I'm, I'm just a grandma, mm -hmm. I'm nobody. She literally said that, I'm nobody. But I see beauty, I encounter beauty through your work, I have been following you, you know, through Instagram. But now I'm face to face with this authentic beauty that I can't account for. You know, and I'm, I'm like, how can you say you're nobody, first of all? You know, that, that would not be right anyways. But second of all, I mean, who would travel from Australia <laughs> to, to see any show <laughs> and, and like there to be open, to be vulnerable, to, to you know, and, and know that it wasn't, it wasn't about, it wasn't a checklist, you know, you're not going to Louvre to see Mona Lisa. It, this was a spiritual journey that she was on. And, and to me that, you know, talk about vocation, calling, it, it's almost like that, right? It, it, it's a magi seeing the stars, and and you're not quite sure why, you know. But but you see the evidence, and and you have to. You're not satisfied until you do it completely, you know. And and you travel afar to get to that manger, and and to recognize, oh, this is 
the key. You know, this is some, this is gonna unlock my life and my my calling, and and that journey it is a journey of uh, you know any undergraduate coming into Whitworth and then you know discovering things and then maybe it is just simply to point them to these evidences stars you know that they need to follow so they can find that you know a baby in a manger but but it's it's something that is profoundly sacred to me and i'm on the board of my alma mater bucknell university and it's not a christian college but i feel the same way about their students and what a privilege it is for you to be able to name it and say it the the baby in the manger is Jesus, you know, <laughs> by the way, you know, that's the, that's what this is leading to. And, and to be able to um, honor both the past and create the future through that. Yeah, thank, that's beautiful. Thank you very much. Marco, thanks for spending the day with us, Absolutely. for uh, your talk in chapel, yeah. for speaking with students. We're looking forward to your lecture tonight. Absolutely. If you want to learn more about Makoto Fujimura, I'd encourage you to uh, go to his website. It's makotofujimura.com. Mako, thank you again. Until next time, thanks for joining us.